Okay. All right. We've uh, we've touched on this, and uh, you've been using a bit of this idea for some time now. Anyway, uh, it's the the business we use when we treat the Earth as a point mass. Uh, we're going to look now at distributed loads. We already did one a little bit where we took a, a beam and I just put a simple uniform distributed load on it, which is exactly what the business would be if we uh, used its weight in the problem, assuming that it weighs the same amount everywhere. Uh, we, could re we could represent that as a distributed load. Well, we need to do, of course, more complex forms than that. Uh, we typically use this symbol small w for the functional form of the distribution with x, where x is the distance along the, uh, along the beam itself. So in this case, we happen to have a distributed load that is constant. Just for that example, and I told you that we could uh, figure out the total load from that. And if we placed it at the center, if its length is L, then, uh, then uh, the total load, oh, let me use an F there, I got two L's. That's not going to work. There. The total load is uh, just that uh, distributed load per unit foot Just as you might expect a, a, a beam. If you went and got a beam and you want to know how much it weighs, they'd say, oh, this, this weighs uh, 40 pounds per foot. And you say, oh, okay, I need 10 feet. That's uh, 400 pounds. I, I got to call Manning to come help me lift it. And it's day off. Uh, so, uh, in, in general, it makes pretty good sense. Um, we did this on the fly about two weeks ago, I think, and, and most of you didn't even flinch at it. So we're going to extend that a little bit and go to non-uniform loads so we can figure out what those, uh, how we represent those. So imagine we have some load, some load curve, and remember that itself is a function of x. And we want to find out the reactions, say for that beam. To do that, we, know we need to understand more about the load distribution. Clearly, uh, there's going to be a bigger reaction on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side, but that's not enough for us. We need to be able to say specifically what the reactions are and uh, then use that for solving the rest of the problem as need be. So we're looking for, for some place where we can put some single load that represents the distributed load. It's got to be the right size. F has got to be the right size, uh, or we're not even come close to representing what the distributed load does. But we also need to place it at the right position. We need to figure out where that is. And maybe we do it from the left-hand side. So we'll, maybe we'll call that X bar, the place where we Take out, we're going to take out the distributed load, 
replace it with a single load at the right spot, and in that way, we'll get the same reactions that we would have gotten with the distributed load. That's our intent here. Because we can do a simple problem of just one force at some single point, we can figure out the, the uh, reactions then for that problem. We've been doing that for weeks now. That's, that's nothing. That's a no-brainer. You would be insulted if I asked you to do that. You wouldn't? <laughs> we, we, of course, need to sum the forces in the vertical direction and sum the moments about some point, and we'd know just where, just what the reactions are for for that kind of loading. That's what we're trying to do here with the distributed load. We need to get rid of it to get a single load at a single place, then we can figure out what the reactions are. Because right now, we don't know how to do that problem. All right, so let's do that problem. Let's do it in ways that we can handle. So there's there's our, our load curve, our distributed load curve. And we consider that to be positive for downward loads because that's what's so common. All right, I'm going to, uh, well, first, first, uh, first we can figure out what F is. F itself is pretty simple. And we did this already and you didn't even think about it, it's just now we don't have a constant load, we have a, a regular. We just need to find the area under the load curve and that will be the total load that we use to replace. And if you look at the constant load we have, that's exactly what we did. It was the constant times the length of the beam. Uh, what we were doing on the fly was the integral. So we already know what F is equal to. The integral of the load curve along the length of the beam. That's pretty, that's pretty straightforward to do. If we have that functional form, we can do that. If we don't have it, we can, you can do that Newtonian method of estimating area under a curve that you did when you did calculus that led to the integral. You can break it into little uh, rectangles and add them all up, just integrate by hand. So we know how much the force is going to be. What we don't know yet is where we're going to put it. So what we're going to need to do is, uh, well, it's the same kind of thing we did that led us to the integral, or would have led us to the integral anyway. We're going to break this into little pieces. Uh, each dx long and we're going to find the we're going to figure out the total moment caused by each of those little pieces uh, about some end so we'll take it to be about the left end because that's a, a really easy spot for us to start but we could do it from any end so there's some position x of this little piece of mass. And let's see. Um, the, the moment caused by that little piece about that end is, uh, let's see, it's in the force is the value for the load curve at that place. That's the height of this times dx. That's the amount of force that little strip supplies. And that was just what we integrated over here. They didn't even bother with those steps. Integral of df. Times its moment arm with respect to our point of interest, we can, we can put that A down there. Uh, its moment arm is x. 
because it's an X distance away, that little strip. So that's the moment caused by that whole piece uh, DF. Is that fair enough? And then of course we need to just do that over the entire beam. And that's the total moment caused by this distributed load with respect to the left hand end, just because that's where I measured x. So if we knew that load curve, whatever that is, we put that in there, multiply that curve, that function by x, and then integrate it, and that would be the total moment with respect to the left end a. What we're trying to do, though, is take this total force and put it at the right spot. We know how big that force is. It's the area under the load curve. We know how big that is. What we don't know, though, is where to put it. If we put it too far to the right, then the reaction at that side will be too big. If we put it too far to the left, the reaction on that side will be too big. We need to put it at just the right spot, the, the, the mama bear spot. It's just right. But we don't know where that is yet. Easy to say, we just don't know where that is yet. We're looking for the place we can we can imagine uh, imaginarily take out the distributed load, put our single load, but we not we got to put it at the right spot. If we don't put it at the right spot, it's not going to count. It's not going to do the job for us. So let's see. Uh, that 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 means this moment must equal the moment arm of that single load times that load. Those two pieces, this integral we just did that is the moment caused by the distributed load, must equal the moment caused by our singular load or they're not going to be equivalent. And that's how we then find it. We place our load, x bar, at, uh, let's see, it'd be ma, the total moment, divided by f. That's just solving here for x bar. But we know how to do those things with the distributed load now. x, w, v, x. over the total weight of that load, the total force that load exerts, which is the area under the load curve. And there we then can now find out not just what the load is, but where to put it. And now we can take out the distributed load, replace it with a single force in the right spot. Now we can solve that problem and find the reactions if that's what we need. So let's test drive it just to make sure, just to step through it with uh, the easiest possible, well, I guess the easiest possible distributed load is none at all, but that's too boring. We won't do that one. So we'll do that constant load that we've already done. 
Because we did that on the fly, and you guys didn't even raise a hand in protest. You just let me do it. I could have, I could have told you anything. I could have been like a presidential candidate, where I just say anything I want, and you just, yeah, yeah, we buy it. Yes, sir, you got my vote. I know, I know, Mr. Romney, you are promising me personally a new job. Bill. <laughs> yep. Guess who needs a new job? <laughs> All right. So there's, there's a. We'll just. Uh, our load distribution is just W. It's just a constant. We don't need to say it's a function of X. And remember that will be given as something like uh, pounds per foot of beam. Uh, could be uh, uh, newtons per meter whatever it is we're working in. So we want to figure out, we already know the, what the answer is going to be, but we want to make sure that this works. We want, to, we want to just test drive it on something that's pretty straightforward. So we want to find some place to put the equivalent load such that the reactions of the two beams are the same. Now, we, we already know what this is going to be like. So it gives us a chance to do it and do it right. Make sure it's working, then we'll do harder ones. All right, let's see. The, uh, the total load, the value, the magnitude of F is the area under the load curve For the, uh, for the entire beam. And since W is a constant, it comes out of the integral who's my master integrator and can integrate dx from 0 to L. Can anybody do it? It just equals L. So it's the constant W times L. Which is just what I said on the fly two weeks ago or whenever we had that and, and you guys all just, yeah, we find that. And that's, if you went down to Lowe's, that's exactly what you said. Uh, 40, 40 pounds per foot of beam. I need 10 feet. It's exactly what you do. What? So it's not like a function of W? It's just W? No, W is a function of X. W is this the function of that line right there that describes the distributed load. In this case, it's a constant. We'll be able to do other things. For example, if you're looking, if you've got a carport or something, uh, and you're looking at snow load, the snow might blow up against it in a curve like that. You want to figure out uh, how how strong to make the carport. Not only those supports, but the support there. And we'll even be able to look at the internal forces in the beam in a couple weeks. So this W is, is nothing more than the function that gives us that curve. That's the load curve. And now we can figure out where to place it. By looking at the elemental moments caused by each little piece. And divide that by the total load, which we've already got. So we don't need to redo that one. We just need to do the upper part. So for the upper integral, we multiply the moment arm of each elemental strip times its height under the curve at that point, which in this case is just a constant W. 
and that'll all be divided by, well, we already have this, WL. We don't need to do the bottom integral again. We just need to redo the top integral. Um, the W's and stuff don't cancel in the integral. Well, they would here, but they wouldn't in future ones just because it's a constant function. All right. W is a constant, so it comes out of the integral. We have the integral from 0 to L of x dx. And that's all over omega L, so uh, not omega W. So the W's do cancel when it's constant. We have just the integral of x dx, which is what? Yeah, that's x squared x squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to L to limits. You, is that the symbolism you guys use for evaluating the integral? Okay. And we still have the L on the bottom. So we have uh, L squared over 2 divided by L or L over 2, which is exactly where we would have put it, exactly where we did put it, a couple weeks ago when you guys didn't even flinch because you trusted me so much. If you had kids, you'd let me babysit them. you trust me that much. I would teach them many new things. <laughs> what? Pretty much do babysit kids. Yeah, pretty much. This is babysitting. You do trust me to babysit. Maybe sitting here right now. <laughs> All right. So uh, on a simple one, that gives us just what we uh, just what we would have expected. All right. So let's 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 do one more like that. That snow load might be something like that, and just figure out what it will be. So we have a beam with a parabolic load, distributed load on it such that, let's see, maximum height is H, length of the beam is L, and this, uh, this load we can approximate with something like h over l squared times x squared. Yeah, and that, I guess that makes sense. When x is 0, then the load is 0. When x is l, then the load is h. So it's just what we've got there. And so we want to figure out two things. What's the equivalent force, and where do we put that force so that we can get the same reactions with our distributed load? We want to come up with the very same problem Where would we put the single load that gives us the exact same reactions? Otherwise, they won't be equivalent. suspect that it's got to be uh, uh, heavily towards the right hand side because that's where most of the load is. Okay. So first thing we do is find the total force exerted by that distributed load 
by finding the area under the load curve. From 0 to L of H over L squared. Remember, those are constants. X squared dx. So you get to do that. Because I'm working way too hard. I've already lifted a 400 pound beam for you. You didn't even say thanks. You didn't even say it. Hey, let me buy you dinner. It's the least I can do. And every year I have an integrating genius in the class. Just lives for integration. Always the volunteers. I'll integrate that, sir. I love integrating. Uh, Mr. Raptor, I have a feeling it's not you. Not into integration. All right, we're just looking for the equivalent force, the imaginary force that we could put in and still have the same total load our distributed force has. Whether that's wind load or you stack something up there or, or maybe that's you sleeping in the bed and that's how you that's how you lay. I don't know. I don't know anything about your personal lives, let's keep it that way. Look at that integrating genius. We have an integration. Come on, clean that up a little bit. We got some L's there. Nothing more fun than getting to the end and start canceling stuff. Clean it up. It's like a, it's like a spring cleaning, throwing all that stuff out of your attic that's accumulated there. All right, most everybody's getting it, I think. Constants come out. integrating x squared dx, which I believe becomes uh, x cubed over tray evaluated 0 to L. Is that right? And so we get h L cubed over L squared 3. And so we get HL over 3. Is that right? So we, we know the total load would be some value over here. And remember that is in terms of weight per unit foot. So that that total load there maybe uh, maybe something like uh, you know the forty pounds per foot. Um, that's the number that would go in there, and that makes the units work out. So we have forty pounds per foot, and this is ten pounds. That's four hundred, but it'd be divided by three because of the parabolic shape of it. So we know we've got that little bit already. H L over three. We don't know, however, where to put it. So we need to do that little part next. And that's the integral of X times the load curve. divided by the total force, which is the area under the load curve, but we've already done that. So we only need to do the top part. Zero to L of X times the load curve, so it's H over L squared X cubed DX. And all that over HL over 3, because we already did that. Passing notes in class? Yep. Ms. Grove? Thank you. Already did it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's why you're my favorite student. Oh, I guess we should 
respect your wishes to use the hyphenated form of your name. It's Smith Grub. There's a Grub Smith. You don't know. Well, have to ask her. She pays attention ever again. Is it Smith Grub or Grub Smith? Grub Smith. Last name. Grub Smith. Grub Smith. This is Grub Smith. You what? I'm married into the Grub family. So Willingly? Heck yeah. Man, oh man. Isn't that the first thing you look at? Could I stand having that last name? Love, love can't <laughs> what? Yeah. Alright, constant comes out. We're all squared, integrating. Is that right? Doing the doing the integral. That's a bunch of stuff cancels. One, uh, oh, those don't cancel. So we get uh, L to the fourth over four L squared over H L five by three. Is that right? No, no, we lost that bottom H. Hey, hey, that means if we have a parabolic shape, we don't care how tall it is. If we have a parabolic shape, then the X is going to be at some proportion along the beam that's the same for any other parabolic shape we have for those curves. The total, total part doesn't even matter. So, let's see. Uh, we get... Uh, inverter, we cancel that and that and that. And we get, is it 3 fourths L? Did I do that right? Yes. That's what you guys got? Yes. 3 fourths L. So we know that uh, we put it along the beam there, 3 fourths. I don't know if anybody's noticed yet, but, uh, well, this would, this, would, this would have to fall through the center of mass. Right? I mean, that just, that just follows, otherwise it wouldn't give, that, well, that's our definition of center of mass, the place where we put the equivalent force acting as a single spot. And in fact, we, we could do it also in the y direction if that was the same type of load in some other direction as well, uh, if for some reason we needed to find the vertical part of the problem. What it turns out at is that this is the centroid of the area under the load curve. That's the same thing as the center of mass given uh, uniform values in the, into the depth of the board, which means these are 2D problems. So that's the centroid of the area. What's good about that then is, who's got their book here? Anyone? Who's my favorite student? I can run and get mine if you don't. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't mean just any book. I mean a, one book in particular. Which means for very regular type shapes, um, like parabolic shapes or any other shape, uh, it'd be nice if we didn't have to do this. It'd be nice if they already did them and then put them in the uh, put them in the book for us. So there's uh, tables of all kinds of shapes and where the centroids are, both in the x and the y direction. So if we had to 
uh, if we could approximate our load maybe with a circular shape, we'd know, well, you'd know in the x direction it'd be one half, so I didn't even list it, uh, but in the y direction. Now we can do all kinds of other shapes. So uh, a lot of these loads then we can approximate as uh, the shapes we need. And so we can find where the centroids are for very regular shapes by just looking them up. We don't have to do them again. There's our uh, oops. And there, there's the one we just did. We found that, that X is uh, three quarters of the way down the, down the beam. Uh, if it was a wind load or something, it was a sideways load or a, a hydrostatic load, the load on a wall uh, of some kind, then we'd need to know where Y bar is. And so that's why that's also given. So clearly some of the shapes we can't really use. I don't know what kind of distributed load that is. There it is. And we even have 3D solids for uh, some of these. If nothing's listed, it's just because it's so obvious that uh, if you have to ask, uh, we'll do whatever we can to embarrass you. <laughs> All right, so lots of shapes in there. But we got to spend a day or two just making sure we can do some of those. So we just did one. Let's uh, let's step it up a little bit.
and we want to find where to put the uh, where to put the equivalent load, and of course what that load is. Somewhere near the end there, a little bit, just because it's getting heavier as we go to that end, and we need to figure out how much that is and where to put it. All right, let's figure. Let's the force, the the total force of that, the total weight of that piece, whatever it is of some length L and uh, some density distribution. Let's see, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be, let's see, it's mass times gravity, right? That's weight, but the mass varies with length. So th that's that's then the general idea of what we're doing. Uh, I guess we could look at it as if we take a little elemental strip of this, it's the weight of a piece of that taken over the whole length of the beam. So. Its weight is dW, and we got to integrate that. Let's see you now. Uh, dm dm. The mass of that is let's see. It's the uh, density at that point times the volume at that point. Is that right? Of that little elemental strip. Sorry, I don't mean a capital M there. I mean a little m for mass. Capital M usually means moment. And the density, we know at whatever point x, because we've got that function. So that's rho zero, one plus x over L. And the volume of that little piece is A dx. So that's what we have to then integrate. Let's see, G comes out, or zero comes out, A comes out. Integrating from zero to L, uh, just the uh, one plus x over L dx. That look about right. And so that integral you, we can do. Those all came out. Then we integrate from x, plus x squared over 2l, 0 to l. Is that right? I think. That look okay? Alright, so you can, you can finish that little bit. That, remember, is the total weight of that beam of varying density. Circular cylindrical beam of varying density.
right? Is that what you guys got too? So that's uh, that's the total force then that we now know we need to uh, put in there. We just don't know where to put it. If there was constant density all the way, we just put it in the middle, but it's not. What next? That's the total force. We need to find where to put it. How do we do that? That's the type of thing we looked at before, only that was a planar problem of constant density. This is a, a well, sort of quasi 3D. So we have to do the same thing we did before, where we now multiply that weight distribution function by the moment arm of each little piece. And the weight distribution function is uh, the one we've got here. G rho zero A one plus X over L DX. That's the weight of each little piece times the moment arm of each little piece, and then all of those are added up together. That's the total moment with respect to that left end, just because that's where I was measuring x, or with respect to the origin, I guess. And we divide that by, we, yeah, we divide that by the total force, because the force times this unknown moment arm should equal the same moment, so. We now know that G rho zero A L plus L over two, which we've already got. Okay, so you can finish that up, see what you get. Maybe we should make it a get out of class question. Since it's a Friday, maybe we will. Remember, if you shout that out, you're disqualified. If you ask me for any help whatsoever, you're disqualified. If I don't like you, you're disqualified.
bunch of stuff cancels out. If you think about it, it should. And what we're actually finding is the uh, center of mass, the centroid of this, uh, this piece. Who's there? We have, we have, oh man, it's 45 seconds to get out early. Who's going to do it? Same for any planet, any initial or final density. Yes, you may go. It's all going to come down to be a function of L alone. Uh, and don't forget on the top part, you got that X, extra X in there. I think you could all do it. I think it's just the pressure of it that's killing everybody. Get out early. You're right, it's not that. <laughs> units wouldn't work. Remember the unit, it should have units of length only because we're looking for a position. You have a two in there, plus two. That doesn't have any units. Or maybe it does, it just doesn't have the same units as the other one. Oh, all right. I don't really want you to stay. What is it, Smith? Burger Smith? What was that? Burger? Burger? <laughs> what was that? I <laughs> what? Well, what? What's your name? <laughs> Burger Smith. It's in Burger Smith. It's Scoot Grover. Yeah, what happened? Oh, Grub Smith. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I just forgot. It keeps changing. How do I know what it is? Five nine cell. Five nine cell. So a little past. Halfway with the uh, center of mass of that piece. 